Bible class this evening? So the, the book of Micah. Um, we're going to spend over uh, two weeks uh, to, to think about this book. Um, and over those two weeks, we're going to try and understand the meanings behind the prophecies that Micah has written down. And, and we're going to try and apply some of these lessons to our own lives. Micah is one of the shortest books in the Bible, totaling just seven chapters. But as always, the, the Word of God, uh, it, it, as always in the Word of God, there is no shortage of content or lessons for us. So before we go into the book in, in, in more detail, let's have a look at some of the background information um, that we can think about in the book of Micah. So the meaning of Micah is, who is like God? And it's believed to be a shortened name of Micaiah, which is just an, an, another A and I in the middle. We're told in verse 1 where Micah was from. He's called, he's called Micah the Moreshite. Micah was a native of Moresheth. And it's a common belief by many commentators that, and I think this is probably the most likely, that Moresheth was not the same name as in verse 15, Marashah, but a town called Moresheth Gath, which is in uh, verse 14 of the first chapter, which lay near Eulathropolis, west of Jerusalem, on a border of the Philistine country so-called to distinguish it from Moresheth of Judah. Micah prophesied sometime between 750 and 686 BC, and it's believed that his book was written around 686 BC. And at this time in the world's history, there was quite a number of prophets warning the people in that area. And during Micah's life, there, was, there were other prophets, people who I'm sure he gained strength from and gave strength to. As we read in verse 1, Micah prophesied during the time of Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. But we also know there are some other contemporary, contemporary prophets during that time, of uh, Hosea and Isaiah. So let's just read the first verse of Micah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Micah the Moresite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. And if we turn over to Hosea in chapter 1, we can read, The word of the Lord came, that came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And in Isaiah chapter 1, we read, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And in our introductory reading, we, we read about Isaiah, didn't we, in those final two verses. And we'll come back to that chapter a little later on. As Jotham was the son of Isaiah, we can deduce that Micah came along a little later than Hosea and Isaiah. He prophesied over three generations of kings, and in that time there was quite a lot of change. Let's have a look at some of the summaries of these three kings, so we get a feel for the background of the time and the situation that the people were in that when Micah was prophesying. So 2 Kings chapter 15 and verse 32, please. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old he was when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jesh Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burnt, burned incense still in the high places. He built the high gate of the house of the Lord. And if we turn over to the next chapter, chapter 16 of 2 Kings, we read, In the seventeenth year of Pekah, and the son of Remaliah, Ahaz the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, yea, and he made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed burnt and burnt incense in the high places, and on the hills, and under every green tree. And then in chapter 18, that we, we just read just a few moments ago, And now it came to pass, in the third year of Hosea, 
son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty-five years old he was when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. And his name also was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. And he removed the high places and broke the images, and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. So during this reign of the three kings, only one did everything that God asked for, and that was Hezekiah. Jotham, even though he did right in the sight of the Lord, he did not remove those high places, which was such a stumbling block for the people. Jeremiah, who we know well, was a prophet who referred to Micah in one of the few acknowledgments of another prophet that we have amongst the minor prophets. So we turn with me to please to Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah 26 and verse 18. <coughs> Micah the Morassite prophesied in the days of Hezekiah king of Judah and spake to all the people of Judah saying Thus says the Lord of hosts Zion shall be ploughed like a field and Jerusalem shall become heaps and a mountain of the house as the high places of a forest. Did Hezekiah king of Judah and all Judah put him at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord, and, and besought the Lord, and the Lord repented of the evil which he had pronounced against them? Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. So then what does Micah tell us within his book, with that background information? And why does God give us these words for our learning? Well, we can read a, a very basic summary in the first verse. If you flip back with me, please, to Micah. We, in that first verse we can see that it's concerning Samaria and Jerusalem, those capital cities of Israel and Judah. But this book can be divided into, into separate sections, some which we'll consider this evening and some in just a few weeks' time, God willing. So chapters 1 to 3 is the judgment against Israel and Judah. Chapters 4 and 5 is the hope for Israel and Judah. Chapter 6 is the Lord's case against Israel. And in the final chapter, chapter 7, the gloom turns to triumph. And this evening we'll be looking uh, primarily at chapters 1 to 4. But as I was studying the, this book of Micah, one of the things I noticed was a parallel style to Revelation. They both tell us of prophecies of things that are to come to pass, and, but they are also interlaced, interlaced with hope, glimpses of the kingdom, and something which we will come on to later and next, in the next session. So then, with that introduction to the first chapter, and the thing that immediately struck me as I was reading this chapter is a distinct shortage of background information that perhaps we're usually used to in the New Testament letters to the Ecclesias. The introduction is short and to the point. So verse 1, The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Marathite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So that's the whole introduction, brothers and sisters. Looking at most, if not all, of the other minor prophets, this seems to be the format that God has chosen to start these books. Perhaps this is an indication that the tone is set for the book. For warnings, even in our time, do not generally start with a long, nice, welcoming introduction. They get straight to the point. So then we read in verse 2, God says to all, listen up, this is what's going to happen. A sharp, decisive, hard-hitting start to the book. Hear, all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witnesses against you, the Lord from his holy temple. And after this introduction, the chapter is split into two. Verse 3 to 7 is the judgment against Samaria and Jerusalem. And then in verses 18 to, to, six, uh, eight to, six, to 16, there is weeping and mourning. So if we just tackle these two sections... Um, in, in, their, um, in, in their two parts. So verse 3 to verse 7. Well, verse 3 starts to inform the people that the Lord is coming to judge Samaria and Jerusalem. We see that the power of God has, that the, the, the power that God has, that, he, that he's coming down from his dwelling place, and he's coming to tread on the high places, the important places on earth. Tread in this verse means to take ownership, and as we know, God has the whole world in his own ownership. 
but here he's reminding the people that this is the case, putting them in their place. This word tread can also be translated as come. And if we look at the first instance of this word, we see there is a nice um, parallel to the Lord Jesus. If I just read to you Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and it shall crush the forehead of Moab, and break down all the sons of Sheth. So just as God was coming down on the kingdoms of Israel and Judah to show ownership of the land, so will Jesus, as we know from elsewhere in the scripture, he will return to take ownership of the kingdom here on earth. And the thoughts may go to Nebuchadnezzar's dream when the stone will encompass the whole earth. That great day which we pray will come soon. That day that we pray that the whole world will praise his name. And when the Lord will show his ownership and tread on the high places in this earth. So if we then go down to verse 5. <coughs> for the transgressions of Jacob is all this. For all the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Micah tells us that the transgressions are in the heart of the countries. The capitals have given up their responsibility to the rest of the nation. High places within these nations have moved away from the commandments and the law that God has set down for them. So what will the Lord God do? We're told in verse 6 and 7. Therefore I will make Samaria as an heap of the field, as the plantings of a vineyard. I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces. And all the hives thereof shall be burned with the fire. And all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. For she gathered it of the hire of a harlot. And it shall return to the hire of a harlot. So God would, in effect, reduce the land to nothing. The phrase I would discover, the foundations thereof, is a key phrase here. Given us the image that the, that the structure will be removed and stripped back all the way to its solid foundations. At this point, perhaps we can remember the well-used Sunday school parable of the wise man building his house upon the rock. These foundations are what were and would be still in the land, foundations that once again could be built upon. And we too in our lives are built upon foundations. For those of us who went to Sunday schools, the lessons are there, those building blocks for each one of us, for everything we learn afterwards. And those who perhaps didn't go to Sunday school, um, they've had to work hard to understand all the lessons from Scripture, to build their own foundation and to build upon that. The immediacy of this prophecy reflects the speed of the fulfilment of the prophecy. For in 722 and 723, Assyria destroyed Samaria, the ten tribes under Sennacherib. But then if we move on to verse 8 to 16, these verses are in future tense. But as we know, the reason for this weeping and mourning has happened in, in Micah's lifetime. We should think of a section, this section as a historical passage as to what Micah went through himself. Think of the emotions that Micah went through, not only knowing what will happen, but that he knew that the people wouldn't listen to him, and therefore they would not listen to God. The disappointment and sadness of knowing what will happen. In verse 8 we see the effect that this had on Micah. He says he will weep and wail and go barefoot and naked. The commentators suggest that this nakedness points to the ritual of lamentation, when the mourner, mourner would not be completely naked, but would be wearing a garment of mourning, a coarse, a sackcloth-like covering woven from goat hair and typically black. As we read that again in our introductory reading that Hezekiah did that in verse uh, chapter 19. But it also perhaps points us back to events such as Jacob and Joseph. So if I read to you uh, a couple of verses from Genesis 37. And you knew it and said, It is my son's coat, an evil beast has devoured him. Jacob is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put on sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And in Jeremiah 6 we read, O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning, as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. 
And as I said, we, we can also look at our introductory reading that Hezekiah too followed this ritual in 2 Kings 19. So if we then move on to verse 10 of, of Micah chapter 1, we read about the rolling in the dust, another ritual of mourning. And in verse 16, the symbol of shaving their heads is a ritual of mourning. These are very public and obvious signs for those around to see. We can imagine those people who heard the words of Micah being reminded of the prophecy after they see Micah in mourning, so that they may remember the sin they have committed, but also reminded, as we see later on, this isn't how it will end. In verse 10 he tells the people in Gath not to tell anyone about this destruction, as the Philistines would know and revel in the problems of Israel, much in the same way that David and Jonathan did in 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 19. The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places, how, they are, how the mighty fallen. Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. In some of the remaining, uh, remaining words that we read in the first chapter in Micah, there are a number of places uh, 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 named. And I'd like just to, to go through some of the meaning behind these words. So Gath, as we just thought about, is don't tell the enemy our misfortune. Bethli Afrata, which is in verse 10, means in the house of dust, roll yourself in the dust. Verse 11, Shafir, means the inhabitants of the pleasant town will go away in shameful nakedness. Zainan means the inhabitants of the going out town will not get away. In verse 11 we read Beth, Bethizel, which is the people of the foundation house, will lose their support. In verse 12, Maroth means the inhabitants of the bitter town will wane in vain for a change of fortune. In verse 13, Lachish means those in the, the team of horses town will hitch their team up of horses to retreat. Morsheth Gath means the inhabitants of the betrothed town will be departing to live with their new husband, the king of Assyria. And we can go on. But we can see that these names of these cities are very apt for the judgment that was about to be given to them. So if we then move on to chapter 2, it starts with yet another, more, with another warning. Verse 1 and 2 warns the people who plot and plan iniquity, and once again tells those who plot these things what will happen to them from verse 3. Yet another quick and decisive statement and judgment straight to the point. So chapter 2 and verse 1. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it, because it's in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away and oppress the man and his house, a man and his inheritance. But we can read of similar people in Psalm 36. So if I just read to you the first four verses of Psalm 36. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart, that there is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself is in his own eyes, until, he, until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off for to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good, and he boreth not evil. So we can see the problems which cause the violence. Because Michael was stating the problem so vividly we can imagine the problem wasn't with just a few people. Seizing land, not buying it, but seizing it. Micah tells us that they first coveted the land, one of the commandments that God said we must not do. But because of that we see how this started on that slippery slope. It probably started with just a few people with green eyes looking around for their own gain. Then plotting to take over land from others, probably far nicer land than they had of their own. Then over time others saw what they were doing and started looking for their own gain. And this example of the effect of what we can have on other people, even within our own ecclesia. We can be affected so easily without noticing until it's gone far too, far too far down the line. Moaning about small problems can have a huge adverse effect on others, an effect that we must try and avoid in our ecclesial life. For we never know the discouragement that it might bring to people, or the unhappiness that it might bring to someone's life. We're all in this ecclesia together, we must try to create harmony amongst ourselves. We should perhaps think when was the last time we asked or we thanked someone for doing jobs in the ecclesia. 
And perhaps we should also count the times in which we've done something wrong. And we've said something wrong to somebody else. And we should weigh up whether we are being a positive influence on others around us. Because there can be good and bad effects on others. We should try to make sure that we have a positive effect on people. Opposite to that time of Micah. We can encourage each other and edify one another by reminding each other of our, the wonderful hope that we share. We can help out in the Ecclesia whenever we can and look to bring the Ecclesia to a better and a happier place. Not just by coming to as many meetings as we can, but by wanting to share fellowship with each other outside these four walls and working in the background without grumbling to aid the continuation of this meeting. We're all hoping that we spend eternity together and we should try harder in this life to communicate, to compromise and enjoy our time together. And so back to, to Micah, we're told in verse 3 of the second chapter what this violent, selfish and greedy time would lead to. Therefore, this says the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which you have not removed your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. God in his wisdom already knows the result from the surrounding nations conquering the people. He knows that they will, what they will say, if we look at verse 4. We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. He hath removed it from me, turning away. He hath divided our fields. God's punishment here really fits the crime. The people were not content with the portions of land that they were given, so they were trying to take more and more for their own land. So God takes it all away from them. He gives it to neighbouring countries, and they complain that they have lost their land completely. The very thing that those evil doers were doing to their fe fellow countrymen. And as God says in verse 5, Therefore you will none have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. They will, be, they will have no, be no longer able to measure out the portions of their land as they reset on the year of Jubilee. Perhaps the people started taking for, for granted what had given to them. The blessings that they have become became their own right in their minds. In a world that we live in, we shouldn't take anything for granted. The government that rules the land that we live in, our jobs, our houses, etc. But we should remember that these have all come from God and that they are blessings upon us. So then we can think about the chapter which we read in our introduction where Sennacherib was taking all the land, all the way up to the city of Jerusalem. So then chapter 3, as we read in verse 1, it's all about you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. He compares the leaders to wild animals, and as we read in verse 3, they turn to God when they need him. The leaders were not only doing things that God asked them not to do, the things that God had put in them to the position to do, they were actually doing the opposite. They were pushing others away from the laws of God. And this perhaps can be summed up by the analogy of being a shepherd for the people or a wolf to the people. Actively pushing the sheep away. I'm sure you can imagine that when the sheep are alone and vulnerable, they are lost in their ways, as those people were at that time. So what will these leaders do? Verse 4 of chapter 3. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. Now the first reference to God hiding his face is in Deuteronomy. If you turn with me please to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31 verse 15. And the Lord appeared in a tabernacle, in a pillar of a cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with your fathers, and this people will rise up, and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them, and will forsake me, and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? 
and I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. Now therefore write ye this song unto you, for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Now perhaps this is a point of discussion for later, but I believe that this is referring to the time of Micah. There are a few other places in the Bible which refers to God turning his face from the people. A truly sad moment for Moses, after all that he had done for the people in his life. He knew that once he passed away, the people would once again turn to the idols, just as they did at the foot of that mount with a golden calf. Emotions must have troubled Moses at this knowledge, but perhaps in his heart he already knew this would happen. But we can also see the parallel to our Lord Jesus Christ here. He knew that he would die, and all the people that he was dying for, i.e. the whole world, would once again fall away to the, de to the ways of the time of Noah, the ways of the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. We as a community must try and help each other through this time of trouble. And we can remember Lot, how he and his wife were taken in by the treasures of this world, so much so that they didn't realise what was happening to them. And it's our duty to look out for each other, to make sure that we're not one of those who turns back, as Lot's wife did. But we look forward to that new city. So what of this prophecy? Well, we can perhaps discuss the fulfilment of this prophecy that Michael spoke of in our discussion of later, time permitting. But there are, I believe, strong links to those in the chapter that we read in our introduction in 2 Kings 18. The invasions of Sennacherib in, in 701 BC was only fully accomplished over 100 years later by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. Had Hezekiah not been affected by Isaiah and Micah, the complete fulfilment may have come significantly earlier. And we can think to the time of Sennacherib that he had the city of Jerusalem, surrounded with thousands of troops, only to be destroyed by God. In the Chronicles of Sennacherib, there is one point of this heroics that he decided to leave out. And wouldn't, and wouldn't we all? So then chapter 4 in Micah, if you turn back with me, gives us a glimpse of the kingdom, as we've, we've briefly thought about earlier on. In the middle of Micah, we have this wonderful hope of the kingdom of God. So Micah chapter 4. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and a word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And, it shall judge, and he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So amidst all the, mis the, the misery that is foretold in Micah, there is a breath of fresh air. And a reminder of no matter how bad the times that we go through are, we still have the hope that we have of the kingdom. Just as Micah tells the people within his prophecy, we too have the kingdom to look forward to. And there are a few verses that are almost a reiteration in Isaiah chapter 2. If I would just read Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2, if you just follow those words in Micah. And it shall come to pass in those last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many nations shall, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For round to Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the, among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruny hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So these two contemporary um, prophets, inspired by the, by the Lord God, gives the same message, adding weight to the fact that they are telling the truth. They are telling what God says in their day and, and for the future prophecies. We read that the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills. Contrast this to the words which we heard earlier in chapter 1, that the Lord will come and tread on the high places and show his authority and ownership on the land. 
now we read of the time when the ownership will be shown forever, when Christ returns, and through the grace of God, forgiveness, and through the gra- grace of God's forgiveness, we may be granted a place in that kingdom. So Micah tells the people, look at what's going to happen. So then verse 9 and 10 of chapter 4. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Have your counsellor perished? That pain sees you like a woman in labour. Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labour. For now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. So God directly reminds them and us what will happen in the future. And meanwhile he will rescue them from the hand of their enemies, reminding them that all is not lost, but it's just a punishment. We too have to remember that all the affliction and all the troubles that we go through in this world are coming because we, of what Adam did. But also that God will rescue us from this moment of destruction of these, of these mortal bodies. We have to remember that God, that in our lives God will only push us as far as we can cope. We all have different amounts for all different people. However, we have to keep in our hearts the thought that this is only a punishment and trials. But ultimately, we too will be saved, and we will have to keep our minds, if we, if we keep our minds, on a future kingdom. In verse 8 of chapter 4, we read of a tower, which I'm be- led, led to believe is the same tower as the one in Genesis 35, verse 21, where Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. Perhaps this is a, a point of discussion later on, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. So then what have we learnt over the first four chapters of Micah. We have seen that the people in Israel and Judah were practicing many things that were against the will of our Heavenly Father. The need for prophets highlights the fact that they need to be told and look at what they were doing and to be warned to change their ways. However, Micah's prophecy was somewhat of a description of what was going to happen and why. The people had disobeyed God and his commandments and he was going to punish them. The people had been led astray by the leaders that we read in, in chapter 3, but we're reminded of the hope that the people have and could have if they only listen to God and his prophets. We too in our lives should understand the laws and commandments by reading the Bible each day, thinking of the days in which we do not, thinking of the days in which we do not think of God and his Son. Our, do, our days feel empty when we suddenly put into perspective all the problems our lives compared to the greatness of the hope, salvation that we can have. Remembering all that has been done for us, we suddenly feel that, that thought of belonging once again. There are many warnings for us in Scripture. We can see them in virtually every book. But like in Micah, we see the foreshadow, the glimpse of the kingdom, to remind us why we should follow his commandments, just as we, just as we can do in Revelation. We can also remember that when a prophet's short-term prophecy comes true, we can believe in the long-term prophecies. <laughs> An example is the kingdom of God for us. And it shall come to pass in the latter day that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted above the hills, and the peoples shall flow to it. So that's the first uh, four, briefly the first four chapters in in Micah. Next time we'll consider chapters five to seven. And this will show the continuation of the glimpse of the future way beyond Micah's time the promise of our Lord Jesus, and then we'll look at some of the transgressions of Israel. We'll see that Micah sadly laments the woeful decay of the religion in the age wherein he lived, and the immorality which overwhelmed the nation. And I'm sure we'll be able to draw strength from these words as we look to the world that we live in, which one day we pray we will see the, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.